We have Greg Mosier on the call. Greg, I really appreciate your time. And uh, we are going to be covering uh, some interesting topics here today because Greg had got his realtor license when he was a mere young lad of 18. And we won't go into his age at this point, but I still look 18, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We're about the same age. So yeah, yeah. Um, we don't have to cover that. We're at no. the age where we, we don't need to brag about that. <laughs> no. Well, let's just say we have experience. We have experience. Yeah. That's so, Greg, why don't you why don't you break it down for everybody a little bit about what you and your team do? But before you do, let's direct everybody. If you want to follow along, head over to uh, Greg's website, the Mosier Group USA dot com. I'm going to make sure to have that link in the show notes because you can tell I already stumbled because. Greg already uh, said there's a reason you got to put that the in front of it. Got to have the Ohio State Buckeyes. The the Ohio State Buckeyes. The Mosier Group USA dot com. Yeah. Um. I really appreciate your time, Greg. But can you kind of give us a little breakdown of what you and your team do? Um. We we work for two, not just them, but two of our biggest customers are are the largest. Uh, I would say rental companies out there or venture capitalists. Um, and we help them source and find properties across the United States. So we're kind of tasked with ones looking over the next year, they want to buy, uh, they want us to get them about three to 4,000 homes over the next year. So it's kind of a daunting task at, at times, but that's, that's the basic rundown of what we do. So we're helping them source. We have an algorithm and computer programs that help us source properties listed and then we have relationships for unlisted properties that we kind of get our hands on before most people see it. So with that being said, we're 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 constantly and daily sourcing and finding properties throughout the United States for these guys. And then if we have anything that doesn't meet what they're looking for, whether it's not the right town or they've already kind of hit their their numbers for that area, you know, we're still out there finding the properties. And if so, if anybody would be interested in anything that we may have, that'd be something that we'd definitely be interested in passing along as well. Sure. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. You you mentioned that you're across the United States. Are there any restrictions to that? What are they looking for? What part of the country? Yeah, they have like 28. Most of them are pretty much the same markets. They have about 28 to 30 markets that they're all kind of looking in. Um, the biggest ones that I see are... Um, Atlanta or Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, they tend to want to be in Dallas. But the problem with Dallas is the taxes there are high. So it's hard to find stuff there. Um, and then when you get to the West Coast, of course, they'd love to be in Seattle and California, but they can't. The numbers mm-hmm. usually don't work there. Uh, Phoenix and uh, in some somewhat Nevada or Las Vegas. Sure. Hottest market that, that we're seeing. So are they primarily single family homes? They're looking for single family homes. Yep. That's and then they convert them to rental property. Is that it? Correct. So they're sure. buying like the one firm owns 85,000 homes, something like that. Um, oh, the other wow. one, I think in the 60, 70,000. So, so it's a, you know, they know what they're doing. They're good. And that's, that's where we come in is to help them find those properties. So, so, so uh, how there is their appetite outpacing what's available in the market right now? Yes, yes, yeah. um, and I'm and I'm seeing that pretty much across the board. It's kind of a weird market, you know. It when you've been in it as long as I have, you see the peaks and the valleys, but you don't see as much of um, what we're seeing now. It's kind of like everybody's on. Like you'll see this sort of thing around Christmas where nobody wants to sell or buy or anything. You know, you see that in the holidays and it's kind of been that kind of mode throughout the year. In other words, like people are kind of like hunkering down and they're not wanting to put houses up for sale. They're not wanting to move. And I think it's probably because of everything that's going on, you know, with the pandemic and politics and all that. They're just kind of like, yeah, let's kind of wait and see what's happening. So it's it's something that I've never personally seen. And now with inflation going where it's going, uh, you know, I worry more about stagflation as it as it continues to take place. But you know, we'll see what that all plays out too over the next you know couple of years. But yeah, I would say your the answer to your question, the simple answer is yeah. I, I think they want more than what because they treat it. 
These guys are treating it like a commodity. They're looking at the property straight up as a commodity. They're wanting to buy it. And they're not looking at it for like, oh, it's we're buying at 10,000 below market value. It, I mean, market value matters, but it really doesn't matter to them because they're looking at it for a long-term investment. I mean, these properties are properties they're going to hold for 10 years. So mm -hmm. they're looking for something that they feel will get them a good return on their investment over that period of time from a rental standpoint. And then, yeah, they're figuring if they make that good purchase, it's going to also, when it comes time to sell it, they'll be in a good position to be able to sell it in those neighborhoods that they're looking at. So it's really, you know, it's, they pay good prices for houses. I mean, they're, they're right there in market value uh, for the most part. And, but it's being able to find the ones that they want in specific areas. That's, that's the hardest challenge that we run into. Yeah. So is, is there a certain footprint that they're looking for? Three bed, two bath is, is yeah, kind of that three bedroom, two bath, four bedroom, two bath, two and a half bath, um, usually under 350. Because once you get over that, once you get over that 350 mark, uh, it's hard to get the rental return and get the cap rate that you want. Sure. Um, and so it, it gets difficult once you get over that price point, not that they're opposed to it. It just doesn't, from a financial standpoint, it doesn't make sense once you get that high. Mm -hmm. You don't have as many people that are willing to rent for the property, you know, for what they need from the rental on those properties. So they're looking, I would say, kind of like, you know, the, the middle class starter home neighborhoods. I, I think that's probably the best way to put it as to what they're mm -hmm. looking for and what we're trying to find continually. You know, the suburban uh, houses are always a positive and they, they tend to like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's kind of where we go and what we're, we're, we're searching for every day. So I, I would imagine that if, if uh, there were some <laughs> investors in those areas that you rattled off or, or for that matter, maybe in some other, you said you get, there's 28 locations yeah. that these companies are looking for. How would they work with you and your team? Well, I got, I got agents and people across the country um, that, that work, that we work with that are on our team. And then what we're doing is we, we're always sourcing. We, like I said, we have an algorithm and a thing that we do to find homes that are in MLS, to find the best homes, you know, to get the best return with that and to narrow it down. And then our people will go look at it and say, does this make sense? And do the numbers actually match up with what we see? So we have that and that kind of goes on on a continue. That's a daily basis. And then we also have some relationships with pretty much every national wholesaler out there. And so we'll see things a lot of times before anybody else sees it. So they'll send us over. We get a daily list from these guys and they'll send it to us. You know, we'll see things before it hits, it hits their, even their websites. Mm. So it gives us an opportunity to, you know, Hey, you know, we, we'd like, we've seen some houses and we're like, Oh, I love this house, but it's in the wrong zip code. I mean, it, or they've, they've met their numbers in that area for the year. And they're kind of on the end of, you know, it's end of the year, they're done. So that would be something is, you know, as we were talking earlier, if it was something that I could get some people that, Hey, I'm looking for this and I'm, I'm wanting that we can definitely then uh, pass those properties and communicate with them and pass that along to them with what we got. Um, sure. And going for there, it, you know, I'm, I've always been real hesitant about taking on a lot of people because I don't think it's a value to do that. But mm -hmm. if you got some good key people that are looking to, do certain markets and do certain areas and we got the properties, you know, I'm either going to just pass, throw it away and move on, or I can hand it off to somebody that I think, you know, it, it makes sense for them to get it. So that would be something definitely that we would be open to, to working with the right people in those situations for sure. Sure. Well, you know, uh, you've been in this business for as long as you have, and you've established yourself with these these couple of clients that are doing majority of your business. I mean, it, it sounds like, and their appetite is extremely strong, and it probably keeps you very busy. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to, I, I got to go down the road a little bit. How have you gone through the process of establishing such a long-term relationship with, with these clients? And and what could uh, others learn from what you're what you've done there? Uh, you know, I think I think the easiest way to put it was, you know, when I first got, like you said, I've been in this since I was eighteen. My mom was a realtor, my dad was a realtor, my grandpa was a realtor, so I grew up in this stuff. And you know, sometimes when you're in it, you don't realize what you know and your knowledge until you start actually being in it, and then you're like, wow, 
Like you don't even know what a cap rate is. Like, how are you doing business? So with that being said, you know, I started off doing traditional real estate. Like I'd list homes, sell them. And I was doing, I was doing, and I'm from, I'm in Phoenix. I, I, I first got my license in Ohio and I was like, man, the, the winters stink and I don't want to be here. And so, you know, I moved to Arizona and the real estate market's been on fire for 20 years. I mean, it's always them in Atlanta are the top two every year. You know, they're up there with everyone. So I, I was able to work that growing, booming market. So I listed in, listed homes. That was the main thing I did was listings. I'd pick up some key buyers, you know, along the way. And I was starting to work with investors yeah, early 2000s. You know, you'd kind of get one or two here, some smaller investors. And so we were doing that. And I was kind of like, I should probably just transition just straight into investors. I like working with them better because they're not worried about what the color of the wall is or the drapes, you know, that sort of thing. They're, it's about the numbers and the facts. And so 2001 hit and 9-11 happened. And like my phone was always ringing because I was always carrying like 50 to 100 listings at a time. And I did, I did VA foreclosures and stuff like that. So, you know, that's kind of where I think I started getting the investors and 2001 hit the phone, quit ringing and it's always slow in the fall anyways. And, and I was like, you know what, this is maybe like the time to just transition into just investors. So I just went straight to investors. The market went crazy. And I, you know, I started meeting bigger, bigger investors and helping them find what they needed and was able to talk the talk that they needed to understand what was going on. And I think that was helpful too. I had the knowledge and the experience to understand what they were looking for. And, you know, a lot of guys, they want to work with investors, but they don't, they don't know what it takes and they don't really understand what they're looking for. And so, but, you know, from 2001 until today, that's all I pretty much then done is just, is just work with investors and do that sort of thing. It's even gotten to the point, you know, I go to my kid's softball or baseball game and they're like, Hey, Greg, I didn't know you were in real estate. Uh, we were thinking about buying a house. I'm like, yeah, that's not what I do. You know, so now my wife's, my wife's licensed. So she's, she's more than happy to do that stuff. But um, mm -hmm. that's really where the mindset is. It's just understanding what they're looking for and then being able to go out and find it and search for it and to be able to identify what they, what they want. And then eh, it doesn't really make sense from a financial standpoint to buy that house. And, and that's, I think, what probably separates us. And then, of course, you know, I think all the other intangibles, being able to follow up with people, being able to do what they need to have done, being straightforward with them and upright, you know, with things. And I think, you know, when you get to that point, it's kind of an easy way to build a relationship. You know, because I look at everything from a long term situation as opposed to making a quick buck. That's not that's not really my concern. Sure. Just to remind everybody, the Mosier Group, USA.com is where you're going to find some more information on how to make contact. But um, it sounds like, you know, when you essentially niched yourself a, a little bit here and, and found found where uh, with with these developers and these investors that you like to work with, it, we, we talked about the 80-20 rule before. You're probably finding it a, a completely different expectations and it's a different situation working with, with this type of clientele. Yeah. And I, I kind of like joke around sometimes that they're kind of like, um, they're a big bureaucracy. So my wife and I adopted a little girl. She's now, she's 11 now. So she'll soon be a teenager. I'm looking forward to those days. Yeah. Good luck to you. So we had four boys and then my wife's like, we're not trying again for another boy or another girl. We're done because there'll be another boy. So we adopted a little girl and she's from China and we had to go through the bureaucracy of dealing with China and the U S to get it done. And it was like nonsense stuff, but you know, you understand it, but it's the same sort of thing with these big investment companies. You have to understand the bureaucracy and what they have to go through. And you have to make sure that they have these certain things done a certain way. And so it's kind of, it's kind of tedious and unexciting in a lot of ways, but they know what they want. And if it, if it, checks the boxes, then they'll move on it. And that's the good thing. I mean, they, they don't have a short, they have no short supply of money. And that's usually the biggest challenge that people run into. They don't, they have as much money as they need. 
So the challenge is for me to find the properties. And that sometimes sounds easier than it is, but that's what we do. So, so well, you know, that, that's got to be very helpful. I mean, compared to dealing with one-off single family homes, they're, they're looking at a, a house to, to live in. Yeah. You go from one person to the next, their qualifications yeah. are going to be all over the place versus you essentially know what those check boxes are with these companies. You just, you just have to find the properties that, if that they match. Number, if they, you know, it's always good when they buy one neighborhood, you're like, Oh, they like that one. Let's keep <laughs> looking in that neighborhood. You know, it's kind of weird, but then they get to a point where they don't want to have too many homes in one neighborhood either. You know, they don't want the whole block, hmm. but it is, it's, it's a totally different scenario. I remember, you know, oh geez, when I was showing houses, you know, you'd show 50 homes to you show someone 50 homes and you're like, are you going to buy? Like, seriously, I like you, but it's sick and tired of showing you houses. Right. Um, where these guys, you know, it's like a yes or no pretty quick. Meh, nah. Yes. I mean, you, you know, and sometimes you'll think, oh, this is exactly what they want. And then they're like, no, we don't want that one. I'm like what? So, and then it's just trying to figure out why. And sometimes it's just because, like I said, maybe they've already overbought for the for the month or whatever. They're like, Hey, we, we need to get our construction under control. Cause they're backed up, you know? So, cause they'll go in and remodel them too. They'll go in and re they'll put $50,000 into it and redo the house. So, yeah. so it's interesting for sure. For sure. Yeah. It, I, I'm always curious as to like when they're essentially buying multifamily, but one house at a time in, in a way. And, and then they, how do they manage all of this when, when it's all said? But they're good. I, you know, I think the same thing, but you know, you know, they've gotten really good at that. And that's sometimes where, you know, the, internally they'll complain about the, the management department or whatever, but they know deep down at the end of the day, they're efficient. And, and that is one reason like they'll, they won't stray out of the certain areas. So like in Phoenix, they'll do Phoenix Metro, but they don't want Tucson. Cause that's where, you know, that's where I live. So, you know, they'll do Phoenix, but they want nothing to do with, with Tucson. Now, one of the other companies they they're doing Tucson as well, but their concern is they can't handle Tucson, you know? And I'm like, well, it's an hour and a half drive, you know, from the East side, but you know, that's, that's their concern. Mm -hmm. And so they stick to that. They have to have a certain number of homes in a market to make it where they're going to be there. So they're like, okay, we're going to get to 5,000 homes or we're not, we're not buying there. And that's truly the way, and they'll stick to that, both of them. So, so sure. that's, a, you know, that's a, that's a different spin on it that most people don't realize. So you, you earlier, you mentioned about the strange housing market that's going on right now. And, and before yeah. we hit record, you even talked about inflation. I hate to put you on the spot, but do you have any predictions? Like what, what do you think is going to happen here? What's, what's going on? I think it's getting propped up right now. I, I, I do. I think, I think there's a lot, of, I think they're propping up interest rates and I think, you know, and so, and the investors are helping prop up the housing market. I, I don't think it's going to be like what we saw in 2005 or two, well, I guess it would have been 2007 by the time it actually hit because 2005, it was still running. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be like that where it's going to be a big crash, but I think it's, it's time for a downturn and the only concern I have is when they're propping it up, it can make the downturn worse. And that's my, right. concern. And, and so, you know, if they're, you know, if the downturn doesn't start to happen, I don't think we're going to see the large foreclosures that we saw. Um, Cause I think Americans learned from that as a general rule, like, you know, let's not over leverage. Cause I hit, I, I remember I'm a teacher. Yeah. And I'm making 150,000 a year. No, you're not. There's no teachers making 150,000 a year. So I shouldn't say no, because I'm going to get a, I'll get a message now when I, from one that is, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> never say never, right? <laughs> never say never, but never say never. But as a general rule, that's what was going on. And it wasn't like the banks didn't know it. I mean, they knew it. So I don't think that's going on as much. I, I think the banks and them are staying a little more stable than what we saw before, but I definitely, you know, you know, people not working and not you're not seeing the, the movement that you're used to seeing in America. I think at some point it's going to have a negative effect on us. See, when I, when I was younger and you might remember this, those days, you know, I remember back in Jimmy Carter days, you know, you had inflation at 12%, you know, and people were doing, 
carry backs and things like that. I got out, I got in the business shortly after that time, but I was still a kid, but I remember that. And it, you know, it's kind of like, that's where I would be more scared of seeing us go than anything else. I'm not thinking it's going to happen tomorrow, but I, you know, I'm just a little concerned that that sort of thing, cause you know, you can't have milk at $5 a gallon. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it starts to affect everything else that goes on too. So I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm hoping to see some more stability, but I'm, I'm not really seeing it as of, as of today, I haven't seen stability in the market at all. So that's kind yeah. of my two cents. So I don't, I don't mean to age us, but uh, it, it's been always interesting when you talk to you, I talk to my kids and, and I was driving my daughter back from hockey last night and she, she was asking uh, what it was like when I was a kid regarding the internet. And I said, we didn't have the internet. Talking about. <laughs> what are you talking about? I didn't have the internet. Yeah. It's, Remember the dial up? <laughs> yeah. So it, it does, it's, it's, it's entertaining when they, they have no grasp of, of that. And I, so I even blew her mind even more saying there wasn't even a Google. We didn't have cell phones. You what? Yeah. We went to a phone and we, like, if we had an appointment at two o'clock, we met them at the specific location or we didn't know where to meet them. You know, yeah. so yeah, we uh, it was a couple of years ago. We watched the Super Bowl uh, as a family, and and uh, it was the first time they'd seen commercials. They're so like, they what? asked if there was a way if we could skip these. What what's going on? What's <laughs> not if we're watching it live? This is where they make <laughs> money. Yeah, yeah, no, it's always fun. What's that big thing behind the TV? Oh, that's part of the TV. <laughs> yeah, that was that's always interesting. So yeah. again, just to remind everybody, the Mosier Group USA dot com. This has been an interesting conversation, I, I, and it's really great to have your perspective regarding uh, quite a few things. Uh, but before I let you go, uh, is there a question or a topic you thought we should cover today? You know, I, I, I'm guessing that you and I could probably talk for hours. Yeah, and, and that's just the way it is. You know, I, I I I don't know if there's one specific topic that I think that we needed to cover. I mean. You know, if uh, if you'll have me back somewhere down the road, maybe we'll talk about the we'll make a list of other things that we need to talk about at that point. But no, I thought we I thought we covered a lot pretty quick. Yeah, and hopefully it gave some people some insight and some different perspectives on things, you know, for what they're trying to do. Yeah, I think definitely did. And, and you're absolutely right. I have a feeling that you and I could probably keep going for quite a while. It'd be interesting to maybe chat in the future about your experience as you've been in the industry for, for this long, since 18 years old, your experience with various real, uh, real estate investors and, and uh, what it, it, building that re- relationship with realtors have been, has been a vital piece of the business. Uh, and, and we found that it's just easier if, to work with certain realtors than others. I mean, that's, that's, that's an obvious statement, but um it's it's kind of neat when the when the expectations and everything are aligned. It's a it's it's a great way to build a team. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we all have that, you know. I mean, we have realtors that we kind of, and that's just life. We have some people we I really don't like that guy, but you got to mm-hmm. deal with them. And then you have some you enjoy working with because they're on the same page as you, and you're you have the synergy, and you're moving things forward, and you're getting stuff done. Even if it was somebody on the other side of a deal. You know, when I was doing regular deals, some I didn't mind, you know, hey, they're doing their job. I'm doing mine. They're working for their customer. I'm working for mine. But, you know, we, we understand the end goal and that's to get help our client get the deal done. And that that was really right. a good perspective. So, so for sure. I mean, but no, I, you know, we covered a lot, but I, I'm sure we, could, like I said, we could talk for hours. I'm guessing if we're talking real estate, that's just the way I am. So, yeah, yeah, no, same here. Well, I appreciate your time. This has been great. Again, the Mosier Group USA.com. Yeah, I'll make sure to have those links in the show notes, but you're welcome back anytime. Hope you'll take me up on that. Oh, I will. I would definitely enjoy doing that. I enjoy it. So, Well, thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a good one.